Hi everybody, my name is Mike Ginninger. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist in the National Weather Service Office in Amarillo. And today we're going to have a part one, the basics, which would be part one of our two-part series with the 2021 Skywarn Spotter Training. This is a basic spotter training class, but I will warn you that we get a little more advanced than most might do uh, in other offices. So uh, while this is a basic class, I would not necessarily call it a basic class. So for the part one, the basics, we're going to talk a little bit about the National Weather Service and our role. We'll talk about severe weather climatology in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles, uh, being that this is the uh, Amarillo office. And we're going to talk about thunderstorm basics and then some basic severe storm structure and spotting. In part two, in the second part of the series, in another recording, we'll talk about some advanced spotter uh, clues for tornado genesis. We'll talk about spotting pitfalls, reporting to the National Weather Service, and safety. And then we'll have a little fun quiz at the end of all that to give you a chance to look at some different scenarios and see what you learned. The National Weather Service is a 24 hour a day, seven days a week, 365 day operation. There's always at least two to three meteorologists on shifts on weekends, nights, holidays. Uh, during the day, Monday through Friday, when all the management staff like myself are here, there'll be eight to 12 of us on duty uh, from most Monday through Fridays. The snapshot here gives you a little insight into the Weather Service office operation uh, in Amarillo. So this is the county warning area. You can see on the lower right the county warning area for all the different weather forecast offices across the country. This is where all your you know your warnings and things are coming from is the local forecast offices and the Amarillo office we are responsible for the top 20 Texas panhandle counties and the three Oklahoma panhandle counties. Our surrounding Neighboring weather offices is the Norman office in Oklahoma, Dodge City in Kansas, the Pueblo office in Colorado, Albuquerque office handles New Mexico, and the Lubbock office to our south down into West Texas. So some of the basics that most people here in the Panhandle are pretty familiar with. Uh, when it comes to watches and warnings, uh, watches means that conditions are favorable uh, for, for an event. Uh, you need to be prepared to, she to seek shelter if threatening weather approaches. Uh, they're issued for a fairly, fairly large area for several hours. It's kind of that first, uh, that first notification of, hey, you need to be paying attention. You need to watch for warnings. Right? If we put out a severe thunderstorm watch that's more focused on severe thunderstorms, you can't roll out a tornado in many cases in those, uh, but maybe not a very high likelihood of a tornado. Tornado watch there is a little more potential of the severe thunderstorms having tornadoes. Warnings are issued for much smaller areas. Uh, they're more specific about what the storm's capable of doing at the moment. They mean you should seek shelter immediately. Um, they're issued for small areas in short periods of time. Now, if you're going to be in a situation uh, that, you know, you have a big outdoor event or something where you may have a hard time getting to shelter for warnings issued, you know, the watch might be where you want to make some decisions about putting yourself in those positions. But in most cases, uh, if you're just at home or whatever, the warning is when you need to take action, uh, move to your safe room. If it's a tornado warning, get away from the doors and windows, those types of, those types of things. So there's lots of ways to get warnings. You know, this has changed a lot in my lifetime. Uh, you think about just in the last 20 years that what the technology that's come along in cell phones and we've all have a have a warning device in our pocket basically uh, still television and radio are good ways to get it of course no weather radio is is still is still there as well Facebook and Twitter I don't know that I would suggest that that should be your number one way to get warnings you know the internet and things outdoor warning uh, sirens those really should be last resort that should be meant for you're outside you're not paying attention to your phone you have no way to really get the warnings otherwise. Uh, but it really should be a last resort. They're not necessarily going to be heard in your home. Uh, weather radio, cell phones, those types of things should be your primary source. And we do really recommend redundancy. Have more than one way to monitor the weather. 
one change that has come about here, or it will be coming about here uh, in the spring of 2021, is with the wireless emergency alerts. And this is the uh, alerting that is built in automatically to most phones where you get the tornado warnings, the amber alerts, and such things as those. And so the uh, before, only tornado warnings and all flood warnings went across with the WIA. And upcoming, some changes will be that the higher end severe thunderstorms, and I believe we're believing two and a half inch hail or 80 mile an hour winds, if those are included in the warnings, those will actually start alerting on this uh, WIA feature on your phone, this wireless emergency alert. And only the higher end flooding warnings, it's using these these tags of how, you know, kind of a ranking of how bad the flooding might be. And so some of the lower end flash flood warnings will not go across. So we'll see less flood warnings, more severe thunderstorm warnings, because we, well, we weren't seeing any severe thunderstorm warnings previously. So I just wanted to make people aware of that change to the alerting. Otherwise, you know, if you want to be able to get all things, then you need to get an app that is on your phone, and then you can get all severe thunderstorm warnings, uh, all flood warnings, and those types of things. That would require some kind of app. Okay, so there's other... Uh, and speaking of apps, there's FEMA has got an app. Red Cross has got an app. Uh, a lot of the uh, your local uh, emergency managers or counties have got some kind of county-supported app. Uh, some of them use uh, one called Code Red uh, in Amarillo. There's an Amarillo Alerts, and there's some websites on there that you can, can look up for those. And other counties around may use something different. I would just go to your county government web pages and see what might be available. Uh, but lots of different app options around there. For the National Weather Service, we have our webpage, which is weather.gov. Uh, you can get to any weather service office from there, or you can put www.weather.gov forward slant Amarillo and go directly to Amarillo page. Uh, there's a mobile site, and there's been some changes uh, with uh, some software on the radar where the mobile.weather.gov no longer has some satellite and radar data. That's kind of up in the air. Uh, hopefully that is something that will be fixed. The forecast side of that app does still work, uh, but it is not a warning app. It also does not provide warnings uh, necessarily, any kind of warning alerting. But it is it was a good app for uh, getting some pretty specific forecast information, and we'll see what happens on the satellite and radar down the line. And social media, uh, National Weather Service in Amarillo, and Facebook is forward slant NWS Amarillo, Twitter at NWS Amarillo, and folks in the panhandle, when they're reporting on weather in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandle, use hashtag PHWX on Twitter. The webpage, weather.gov, uh, Amarillo, Fort Slane Amarillo there, we've got the hazardous weather outlook. And if we're expecting t the need for spotter activation, it would be mentioned in that, something that you can check in on. But generally, we, we tell spotters to activate if, we, if there's a watch or at least start planning to activate. And if there's a warning in your area to just self-activate. There are some organized spotter groups around the panhandles. Uh, but generally, the National Weather Service does not coordinate spotters. The county governments do in emergency management. Uh, but we will put in the statement what we're expecting as far as an activation being needed or not. So looking at the severe weather climatology, uh, moving along here. The definition of a severe thunderstorm is hail the size of quarters or one inch in diameter or larger or 58 mile an hour winds or greater. Uh, generally, we would be able to tell that by the damage, but we it's hard to damage things in the panhandle unless we start getting 65 or 70 miles an hour. But we do measure quite often 58 miles an hour wind, and that would be considered severe. Uh, of course, if there's a tornado, that's part of being a severe storm. We would put out a tornado warning for that. Uh, lightning and heavy rainfall are not criteria for severe thunderstorms. So the lightning can be as bad as it wants to be in the rain. Uh, of course, we would put out a flood warning if we needed to for the rain. Uh, but sometimes we'll get calls. It's like, the lightning's crazy. Why don't you all have severe thunderstorm warning? Well, all thunderstorms have lightning, and there is no lightning criteria. So it's one-inch hail or 58 mile an hour winds, which is generally uh, damage we would, or damage reports if they're significant enough. What is the EF scale? So for tornadoes, we rate these on the EF scale. It goes from 0 to 5. Uh, 0 starts at 65 miles an hour. Five starts, EF 5 starts at 200. 
anything a three or greater is is generally considered a strong tornado. Uh, EF fours and fives will destroy most homes, uh, if not all homes. The difference between a four and a five, sometimes it's said that if a four will knock everything down and a five will clean up the debris for you and just kind of carry it off. That's probably a wise tale. Although you do see a lot of examples of fives that their debris is just gone. Um, but the way we do this, it's, it's a damage scale. And so if a storm doesn't, tornado doesn't damage anything, we can't rate it. And we could rate that maybe EFU. Or if it damages very little, if it's just some tree damage or some power poles, some smaller power poles, it may only be a zero. We may suspect it was bigger, but unless it hit something that was, that was sturdy enough to prove it, we can't rate it that way. Uh, so on the left there, uh, that was a, uh, a pier and beam type home, elevated home that was anchored down. Probably just a, just a step up from maybe a, uh, a double wide mobile home, similar construction, maybe constructed a little better. You know, so d- depending on the strength of the home, you know, like a concrete slab home uh, that's on a foundation, it would take an EF4 to do that damage. But more of a mobile home, it would only take uh, to, see, to get damage of what you're seeing on the left there. Uh, if it's a true, just a regular mobile home, maybe only EF2 would destroy that. Uh, this is a little more substantial, so it was rated a three. But we we base these EF scale or this EF rating based on the damage and and a, and a, the science that's gone into how much wind speeds it takes to do a certain amount of damage to different types of structures. This bigger power pull on the right takes, depending on how how new it is and if there's rotting, uh, somewhere around EF one or EF two to snap that size power pull, for example. So that's how those ratings are done. So looking at the climatology, uh, the top left graph is showing the, uh, since 1950, which is kind of the modern database for tornadoes, uh, when it started, shows that we average about 18 a year in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandle. This is for those 23 counties that I showed you for Amarillo uh, office earlier. It looks like there's a trend of increasing, but that's just really a, the, the reporting getting better. Uh, in 1950, a lot of smaller tornadoes didn't get reported. Most of the tornadoes in this area happen in May and June. Uh, tornado season really tends to ramp up in very late April, and it ends very quickly at some point in June. So we get very hot and heavy for about two months in this part of the country. We can't get tornadoes any time of year. Uh, very rare. We don't have any in January. It looks like maybe one happened in February. Uh, but the peak certainly shows up in May and June. Most of our tornadoes, 85%, are weak, about 13 uh, almost 14% are strong, EF2 or 3, and then violent tornadoes, 4s and 5s, 1%. Most of our tornadoes here happen in the evening, the late afternoon and early evening. It's when all the conditions tend to, to come together. The wind shear tends to start increasing in the evening based on how wind patterns work. Uh, the instability has been high all day, and so you still have that high instability. Your inch wind shear is increasing, and everything tends to come together. And so our peak is really from about 4 p.m. to about 8 p.m., maybe 3 to 8 or so. But we can and have had tornadoes at any time of day. Breaking it down by different sizes of tornadoes, or strengths rather, uh, we have about an EF1 tornado. We have about four, on average, four EF1 tornadoes a year. We have EF2s about two a year in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandle on average. We have an EF3 about one every other year. And we have an EF4 about once every four years. Now, some of these numbers are a little uh, misleading because I can tell you in the last five years, I can count, you know, about four or five times that we had very large tornadoes not hit a lot at the time that they were at their strength, their strongest point. Uh, so we probably, they're most likely have had more EF3s and 4s and maybe a five. We've never had a five reported, but it's just that it hasn't been able to been proven like I was discussing earlier. So you want to know where all the increase is? There you go, EF zeros, right? There's where you're all that increase we're seeing in the annual statistics. So what that tells you is there's a lot more people with, with cameras and video recorders on their phones, and so there's not much that doesn't get documented. That's what that's all about, and it's about the chasers, uh, that are intentionally looking for these things to document them. And so there's not really an increase. It's just that the increase in reporting, 
And, and as you would expect, the stronger tornadoes always tended to get reported well. It's these little five, ten second on the ground things that are being accounted for a lot more. So looking back at the 2019 and 2020 season, uh, first at 2020 here, this is the map on the right is kind of a, a hot spot map. It's all the warnings that were issued uh, in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandle. Uh, and you can see where there tended to be a little convergence of, of a lot of severe storms in and around Pampa. Uh, there's some geographic reasons for that with how the cap rock, the, the elevation changes here. That kind of help with some things. Uh, it was a down year, though. We issued 220 severe thunderstorm warnings in the Amarillo office. We usually, usually issued double that, but La Nina had kicked in, then the drought was kicking in. Uh, we've issued, we issued three flash flood warnings and five tornado warnings. There's the tornado warnings. Uh, we had more tornadoes than that. We had a bunch of land spout tornadoes. We'll talk more about those last year. And there were sort of the flood warnings were issued. So it was a slow day, uh, by the number of warnings and the number of events that we occurred or that occurred. And you can see just looking at this map, you can, that picture there, uh, is a pretty good idea of where the dry line was tending to set up last year, very near Amarillo to Dalhart. And so as you would expect, uh, that's kind of a focus for where these storms like to start forming. So from there eastward is where a lot of severe weather was. Looking at the last two years, you see a huge difference between 2019 and 2020. 2019 was a busy year coming off of an El Nino. 37 tornadoes in 2019, only eight in 2020. Uh, six, almost 650 severe reports to a little over 250. So big drop off with the drought starting. Uh, the largest hailstone in 2019 was five and a half inches. The largest hailstone in 2020 reported was 3.25. So definitely a down year. We did have a stronger wind gust, at least measured at 98 miles an hour in 2020. A lot more flooding with a lot more rain in 2019. And the map on the left, you can see where all the tornadoes were. Uh, again, a lot of land spouts. We'll talk about what those were or what those are later in the talk. Uh, they are a big headache for forecasters trying to predict them. They don't show up on radar well. Um, but it's a kind of tornado, and we'll talk about it more. So why do we need you? Why do we, why do we still have these spotter classes? Why do we do this? You know, ground truth is still important. We still we keep records of – we don't keep records of how many warnings we issue. We keep records of reports of severe weather. And insurance companies are using this. We get calls all the time of insurance companies trying to check. I have this, you know – and they're, they're, they're wanting to confirm that they've got a report uh, or a claim for a certain day, and they don't see reports for that day of severe hail. So it's important to have those in there because it's being checked on. Uh, but it's a public record of when that severe weather happened that's studied later. Scientists study it. Students study it. Emergency managers go back and look at what their, their threat is based on how many reports of hail have happened in their county. And so that is all utilized later on. There are limitations to radar and science still. Uh, the biggest radar limitation is that the beam gets higher with height uh, with the curvature of the earth. So the beam is at 500 feet you know, nearby Amarillo. So we're getting a, pretty much all of the lower part of the cloud. But in Perryton, we don't get the lower part of the cloud at all because it's 8,500 feet. There's also beam bending things that can happen. They can be bent upward and downward, and we won't know that that's happening, that the atmosphere is causing that. And so things won't be at the height that we're thinking they are. Features are not at the height we think they're at. Uh, so that can limit what we, you know, the hail size or what we're thinking on the hail size that cause that to be incorrect. Uh, so the spotters provide us details that we can't see through remote means. And the, there's going to be better warnings when we're getting feedback. And we think the hail's this size, but then we get confirmation, no, this is what this strength of storm is going to do today and what's what it's doing. So it's going to improve the warnings. Getting feedback of, yes, you're correct, you need to keep warning on this is important. You know, if we put out a tornado warning and we never get anything on it, we're likely to discontinue a tornado warning. And what if there was a tornado happening and we're thinking, well, there's not because we're not hearing anything, and then we don't continue these warnings, that can become a problem. So even we have a tornado warning out, we want those reports. And the public responds to reports better than they do to radar indicated. So the only way that we know if there's a tornado or how large the hail is if a human tells us. Uh, so we need you. The radar is only seeing and telling us what's going on up here, but the spotters are telling us what's going on at the ground. So for thunderstorms, 
the basic thunderstorm, we're going to talk about how thunderstorms work. And thunderstorms need three ingredients for just this basic thunderstorm model. Instability, and that refers to how quickly the atmosphere cools with height. Moisture, we usually measure that in dew points for surface moisture at least. You want 50s or 60s, maybe 70s further south. Most of our severe weather happens with 50s dew points, maybe 60s. Uh, now, we're in the panhandle, so I've seen severe weather with dew points in as low as the upper 30s and in the 40s, but that's not necessarily common in other parts of the country. You have to have a lot of dynamics going on for that to happen. Uh, and then something, some source of lift uh, to get the air moving upward. Instability is how quickly the atmosphere cools off, right? Uh, if you lift warm air and it gets lifted up in the atmosphere and it's now warmer than the surrounding air, just like a hot air balloon, it's going to rise. So here on the right here, you can see this hot air balloon. Why is this balloon rising? Well, it's rising because the air has been heated in it. And warm air is more buoyant than cool air. So because the air in the balloon is warmer than the air outside, it lifts itself up. The cooler air almost pushes underneath and lifts it up. The same thing happens with a thunderstorm. So if you could lift the air a little bit, then that that it's going to get where the air in that that upward moving air is warmer than the surrounding air. And it's going to move up on its own. And as it moves up, the water, uh, hot air holds more moisture than cold air. So it rises and it cools and it can't hold the moisture. And so it starts condensing and you get a cloud and it, so on and so forth. That's kind of how they work. Um, and so that's why the colder it is up higher in the atmosphere, the more unstable it is. Because if you lift this air and it gets cold really quick, it's really going to become buoyant and want to go up quite a bit. So a lot of times you'll hear meteorologists talk about that there's a cap. What does a cap mean? Well, it means that there's actually a little bit of air that's the standard atmosphere just gets cooler as you move up. But that's not really what always is going on, especially at night. And so a cap means that there's a little bit of air that's actually a little warmer above the surface than what's going on right at the surface. And so if you take a parcel of air and you have a source of lift and that can only get that parcel of air up to this point, that air that's been lifted up is not warmer than the surrounding air. It's actually cooler. And so the response is, is it's going to kind of sink back down to where it's happy. And that's a stable layer. And you're not going to get thunderstorms forming if that's all you can do. Now, if you can get warm down low enough to where your atmosphere just gets cooler as you go up, that's one way to do it. Or if you can have a little bit of lift that is enough to get that air up to this point and get past that cap and break the cap, we like to say, now your parcel of air is warmer than the surrounding air and it's going to rise on its own through that same process as the hot air balloon. And so the initial stage of thunderstorm development is called a towering cumulus stage. In the towering cumulus stage, you've got this upward moving air that's in what in this developing storm and that is called an updraft. The cloud base forms you, you know, could be anywhere from a thousand or a few thousand feet to eight or 10,000 feet, depending on the atmosphere. Uh, and the freezing level is usually, even in the middle of summer, is usually 12 to 14,000 feet. And it's more less than 10,000 feet earlier in the spring. Uh, the last few days while I've been doing this recording, it's been at the surface and it's been snowing. Uh, but uh, so most of this thunderstorm that's developing storm is actually below freezing. You get very sharp edges of these clouds as they're forming when the updraft is strong at this point. At the mature stage of a thunderstorm, you got this updraft. As it gets higher, it's cooling, and it gets closer to the temperature outside of your updraft area. And so it starts reaching the equilibrium or close to the equilibrium. So the updraft is weakening as it gets higher up in the cloud. And as it weakens, it eventually may have a little bit of momentum and spread sideways where it reaches that equilibrium level and you get that anvil that forms at the top. But it, the raindrops start collecting and they also are a, start able to fall back down through. They become heavy enough that they start falling back down through into the updraft. It can't sustain it. And they gain some momentum and that downward current of air actually will come down and crash all the way down into the updraft uh, from above. And so in this ordinary thunderstorm life cycle, the downdraft that develops actually ends up killing off the storm. It just kind of goes up and it takes about 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, but at the mature stage, you've got a developing downdraft, which is all this cold raindrops creating this downward current of air. Uh, and you still have an updraft, but it's weakening at this point. 
and the, sh- sh- the clouds are very sharp in appearance at that stage. At some point, the downdraft overwhelms the updraft. It cuts off all the updraft, all the inflow into the storm. The storm becomes downdraft dominant, and it just pushes all this cold air and, and rain out. The edges of the cloud become more wispy in appearance, like what we see here on the left. Again, this life cycle lasts 30 to 60 minutes, and it pushes out these boundaries that we call gust fronts or outflow boundaries. And you'll, you've all felt that cold wind hit you before the thunderstorm gets there. That is the gust front or outflow boundary. It's like a mini cold front, but instead of coming from Canada, it's coming from 25, 30,000 feet up in the atmosphere. Those outflow boundaries can be the forcing that causes new storms to form and many times are. So based on what I told you, which of these updrafts do you think is the strongest? I'll give you a second to look at that. And I will tell you that based on the sharpness of the cloud edges, at the, this moment, the strongest updraft is in B. Notice C is more mature. It's taller, but it's already starting to get wispy. A has got a lot of wispiness to it. The sharper, uh, cumulus, uh, coliform looking, cauliflower looking to this cloud is B. Downdrafts, uh, all thunderstorms, again, have updrafts and downdrafts. If the downdraft uh, is severe, it's called a downburst or a microburst or a macroburst, but generally a downburst. Uh, So, you know, generally thunderstorms may have a downdraft of 20, 30, 40 miles an hour, but in the right circumstances, that downdraft might be over 60, in more extreme cases, over 100 miles an hour. Uh, One way that that happens is if there's drier air below the base of a thunderstorm, and the raindrops fall down through that, some of them evaporate. And when you evaporate water, it causes cooling. Think about why do we sweat? Because that water evaporates off of us and it causes cooling. It cools us off. So the water falling down and when it evaporates, some of it cools, which causes it to uh, accelerate downward because it's like reverse convection, right? This heat moving up, you're cooling the air. It's It's gonna accelerate downward. And that's how you, one way that you can get a strong uh, downburst. So any thunderstorm, even that basic thunderstorm life cycle, can produce a severe downburst. We also get severe updrafts. Now, you don't feel it with the wind hitting the ground, but that's when you get severe hail because it's the stronger updrafts are able to maintain a larger hailstone in the sky, and it causes your hail to grow. So you can't have severe storms. With just the basic thunderstorm life cycle, if your instability is great enough or you have some dry air coming into play. Two types of uh, downburst, a microburst and a macroburst. Microburst is the smaller of the two. It's less than three miles, less than two and a half miles, actually. Lasts for just two to five minutes, well over 100 mile an hour potential wind. Most of them aren't going to get that strong, but there's potential for that to occur. Macroburst is larger. Uh, They're greater than two and a half miles. They last longer, five to 20 minutes. Uh, Their maximum wind speed, interestingly, is actually less, but still over 100 miles an hour. And a clue that this is occurring, that you have a downburst and a stronger downdraft here, is this rain foot. As the rain uh, shield comes down, it hits the ground, uh, the rain shaft hits the ground, and it has to spread sideways because of that momentum coming straight down, and it has to spread out when it hits the ground, and the rain gets pulled with the air, and it creates the rain foot like you can see here. And the damage below is what that rain is, you know, was underneath that, uh, was underneath that rain shaft. Here's another example that Steve Kerr shared with us a few years ago, uh, showing an extremely large rain foot over Paladero Canyon. Very likely that this storm it has, probably in this case, most likely a severe down uh, downdraft or downburst. Uh, but you can have a, a smaller rain foot that, that necessarily mean that it was a severe, but certainly that there was. Uh, you know, higher than normal wind coming out of it, at least. So we're going to add a fourth ingredient to these called wind shear. Wind shear is, refers to the change of wind speed and or direction with height, right? And uh, these images are, the left image is just a uh, wind shear of just a, a speed shear, just increasing the wind speed with height. And on the right, we've got change of direction and speed, Uh and this is important in these thunderstorms. It's a game changer for thunderstorms. And the 
besides the fact that they create rotation, as the sketch is showing that you can create rotation just by having increasing winds with height, you create these rolls in the atmosphere. The bigger part of this is that these things tilt the updraft. And what happens when you tilt the updraft? The downdraft forms down shear, downwind where the stronger winds are up high. It forms away from the updraft area. And so your updraft and downdraft can work together instead of working against each other. And your updrafts can last longer and get stronger because they work together instead of against each other. And the example on the right here shows that you can see visibly these tilted updrafts in these storms. And it's a clue that you've got some wind shear going on. This tornadic storm, you can tell it almost looks like a different thunderstorm in the background, but that is actually the top of the storm is extremely displaced from the bottom because this is an extreme wind shear case from November 16, 2015. Base of the storm is much closer to us than the top of the storm. So we are going to talk about mainly two types of severe storms, squall lines and supercells. While single cells, that basic thunderstorm model, they go up, they come down, and multi-cells, both can be severe if the instability is great enough or there's some dryer in there. The most significant severe weather in this country comes from squall lines and supercells, and so that is where we're going to focus. And sometimes you hear dorky meteorologists talk about quasi-linear convective systems. That's just a fancy way of saying squall line. And uh, so we're going to talk about these two types of severe storms. Squall lines occur, they're, they're moderate to strong wind shear events. They're linear in appearance. They form along some kind of boundary, so your updraft is elongated along a boundary. Uh, many times you'll have a shelf cloud along the leading edge that's caused by outflow from these, strong outflow from these storms. Quite often they're severe, not always. They can produce large hail and widespread damaging wind. They can produce very, you know, large hail, maybe two inches or so. And maybe if you get rotation within a squall line, you may can get a little larger than that. But more common is a lot of smaller hail, maybe one inch or smaller. But the wind, they're really known for the wind uh, with these types of storms. Uh, sometimes you can get spin-ups in these that cause tornadoes. And when squall lines bow, like this example here, uh, the sketch here, when they create a bow, and like what we see in the radar on the right, that's an indication of very strong wind speeds in the location of where the apex of the bow is, and that the stronger wind speeds is what's causing that storm to bow out there in the middle. Supercells are moderate to strong wind shear events as well. They're long-lived, rotating storms. They're intense, small, low-pressure systems. They're called mesocyclones. The updraft is low pressure there. It's called a mesocyclone. They feed our warm, moist air from miles around. They pose a significant threat to life and property. They create the largest hail and the largest tornadoes. Maybe not the strongest winds, but they can produce the strongest winds. You may get a squall line that can do even better, uh, but these are the biggest, baddest boys uh, in the neighborhood. Only about 10 per to 15 percent of them produce tornadoes. But when you see these largest tornadoes, that's going to be a supercell. So here's a sketch of a supercell. Uh, they have a tilted updraft, right, St uh, that is uh, rotating because these storms have ingested some rotation in the atmosphere and it causes them to rotate. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Because the, the, because the updraft is tilted, you have a rain-free base. Because the rain is falling somewhere else, not in the updraft. So you have a rain-free base. At the top, when the updraft gets stronger, you'll at times see an overshooting top. And that's just an indication that you had so much momentum that you shot past that am anvil equilibrium level. The updraft area is where you get tornadoes, funnel clouds, and what we call a wall cloud. The wall cloud is a localized lowering in the updraft. It's caused because some of the rain-cooled air is ingested back up into the updraft. And because it's already rain-cooled, it's got a higher humidity, and it forms its cloud base lower than the rest of the cloud. It's an indication of where the strongest updraft is, and that is where we're concerned about 
tornadoes. And if the wall cloud starts rotating, we become even more concerned about rotation, uh, about tornadoes. But not all wall clouds rotate, even though the supercell is rotating. You may not be seeing that rotation extend down in there. There's two downdraft areas in supercells, a forward flank downdraft, your main downdraft area where rain and hail falls, and they can be severe, and you get a second downdraft area that's caused that the downdraft splits, and part of it gets wrapped around the storm because of the rotation in the storm, and that is called the RFD, or rear flank downdraft. Many times you'll have a line of clouds along that called a flanking line. So here's a real life example. You can see the updraft tower, tower there, uh, the forward flank downdraft as well, the rain free base. That whole thing is a rotating mesocyclone. You get striations or stacked plates in that. You can see the whole thing rotating at times. Uh, the wall cloud, there's an example. Wall clouds are all a little different for all these storms. Wall clouds tend to point toward the rain area because of the way that moisture is being re pulled back into the storm. It'll point back toward the rain area. If that is rotating, we become more concerned. Here's your rain here. Your hail is closer to the updraft. Why? Because hail is heavier, so it's going to simply fall out sooner than the lighter raindrops that get pushed further away from the main updraft area. If you got a very long extension or relatively noticeable extension of a wall cloud, that's called a tail cloud. That's an inflow or an updraft feature. And a beaver tail is a flat cloud that goes along the outflow boundary caused by the four flank downdraft. We'll show a sketch of that in a minute. And that's a flatter cloud called a beaver tail, also an inflow feature. There are three types of supercells. Low precipitation supercells, like the one on the left, classic supercell in the middle, high precipitation, precipitation supercell on the right. Uh, high precipitation supercells tend to have so much rain that the mesocyclone gets completely wrapped up in rain where you don't see those features well. So you see the features of the updraft area much better in classic supercells and low precipitation supercells than in the HP or high precipitation supercells. All of them can produce a tornado, but tornadoes are much more common in the classic and high precipitation supercells because the low precipitation supercells many times, uh, low precipitation supercells many times are higher based and supercells like to produce tornadoes when the bases are lower. They like the bases to be less than five or 6,000 feet and the lower the better. And sometimes in the panhandle, we have supercells that are have seven, eight, nine thousand foot bases. They don't produce as much precipitation, and they're generally not likely or almost impossible to produce a tornado at some point if the base is too high. So here's a sketch of a classic supercell. There's your forward flank downdraft. You see the outflow boundary that produces, rear flank downdraft, the outflow boundary that that produces, inflow coming into the rain-free base or updraft, which is wrapping rain around it, sometimes completely. More classic is that it just wraps the rain partially around it. You can still see in there uh, into that rain-free base. And that inflow can get very strong. This is an intense low-pressure system. The center of that low pressure is right where those boundaries meet, where that tornado could possibly form, which is right in that location there where everything comes together. And that's where your wall clouds are. That's where your tornado would be uh, right there in the center of basically this intense low pressure system. In the classic supercells, you can get shelf clouds uh, along the leading edge of the outflow. Here's what you may, may see. It could look a little different, but on that forward flank there, uh, here's looking, there's a little bit of a rope or kind of a shelf looking cloud along the outflow boundary here. You could get a beaver tail in that same area as well. The wall cloud is going to be right there in that updraft area where those outflow boundaries meet. And you can get a flanking line along that RFD boundary. And that, that cloud line is not always there. So here's a kind of a look at a classic supercell uh, from April of 2015. And you can kind of see all these inflow features. There's your forward flank downdraft, but those inflow features, the beaver tail, there's a little bit of a tail cloud, a wall cloud, right? You can see that updraft tower. The view of this is from where that A is on the sketch on the right. 
So he's kind of close to the forward flank downdraft area, looking into the into the updraft area, into the wall cloud. Uh, but one thing we want to should point out is, you know, when you're in that location, you will feel the inflow increase. So don't get just caught up in looking at cloud features. Think about what you're feeling as well. Is the wind increasing? Is the grass laying down into the storm? Do you feel these increases? If you are, that means your updraft is increasing and the storm is strengthening. Here's another uh, example of a classic supercell uh, to the west of Stinnett. And on this image, you can see on the right is the left is what we call reflectivity. That's your rainfall, your hail, you know, those types of things that we're seeing. Uh, on the right is the, re the uh, velocity. And in radar velocity, generally greenish colors show wind coming toward the radar and reddish colors show wind going away from the radar. And you can't see wind perpendicular to the radar. So you see the sides of the rotation much more than the front and back because the front and back, that wind is going perpendicular to the radar beam. So that is what rotation looks like on Doppler radar. And that is where you'd be looking for potentially a wall cloud, funnel cloud, and tornado. This part of the storm, again, where are you going to see very close to the updraft area? That's where your largest hail is going to occur. Hail and very heavy rain are going to occur closest to the updraft area. More lighter rain as you get further out. Uh, this little discontinuity you see in the radar image right there, that is, you can actually see the RFD, even though there's no storm there. You can see a little discontinuity where the rear flank outflow boundary is. And you can get severe winds that can extend pretty far away from the storm along that outflow boundary. So be aware of that. Your forward flank outflow boundary, you can see where the red and the green come together, uh, giving you an indication of wind coming toward the radar and away. So you very clearly can see where the forward flank outflow boundary is as well by using the velocity. So if we take a cross section of this storm up on the top left, in the middle ant graphic, you can see what that cross section would look like, showing you that, yes, indeed, there is storm above that rain-free base just to the, west, uh, to the east of Borger here. And that updraft is most definitely tilted. You can see on both images here, the yellow line is the freezing line. Uh, so that's at about 11,000 feet so or 12,000 feet or so. So you can see most of the storm well below freezing. The red line here is minus 20 Celsius. And so that's well into the hell growth zone. Lots of hail being suspended up here, but also being deposited in the forward flank downdraft. Some of it is wrapping around in the rear flank downdraft as well and wrapping around the storm. Here's your RFD. There's all your inflow coming into feeding into the storm out ahead of it. And there's your rotation. So this, uh, we're going to just kind of move around here, look, taking a look at this 3D image of this supercell. And you can see that cavity that is caused by where the strongest part of the updraft is as we get and look underneath. Right about there, you can kind of see that. If you were to take a horizontal cross-section through that, you'd actually see a donut of higher reflectivity with a weakness in the middle of that. If that weakness is completely a donut, it's called a bounded weak echo region. If it's open on one side, that's just called a weak echo region, but that's an indication of a very strong updraft. Here's a classic supercell from June 18th of 2019, moving right into the city of uh, Stratford at this point, and then also it moved into Borger eventually. Uh, this is a video on the right, and you, if you look closely, you can see that here's well, here's your updraft. And your downdraft there, there's a little bit of a rain foot coming out of that, if you notice. And there's your mesocyclone. So there's your updraft, your rotating updraft mesocyclone. But here's your wall cloud. And if you watch really closely on this wall cloud, you can see rotation occurring. So just watch real close, and you'll see the slow, that little piggy curly tail looking thing of a wall cloud. And you can see that slowly turning counterclockwise if you look really close. So I would consider that weak to moderate rotation. 
But you, if it's rotating good, you're going to see it, just like you can see it here. And we'll show you what violent, strong, or violent rotation looks like in a little bit. But right about now, see that? See the rotation, the counterclockwise rotation in the tail cloud, in that wall cloud? So you that is what, in real time, without speeding these things up, that's what rotation is going to look like to you. There's your rain and, and hail. Uh, and like I mentioned, there's a rain foot. And there is, as you see... That hook, there's your rain wrapping around the backside of this mesocyclone right there. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these common features associated with severe storms. Uh, from a distance, again, we talked about seeing this overshooting top, uh, and we'll see some evidence of that right about there. Uh, on this storm, very sharp cauliflower appearance from a distance is an indication of a strong updraft. And again, these storms, these updrafts are not a constant. They cycle, they get stronger, they get weaker. Here it's weaker at this point in this storm. And then with time, you'll see this thing just explode right there as the updraft strengthens again. And that's your overshooting top. Tilted updraft, you'll see that tilt to these from a distance as well. Uh, a little closer, uh, you can see shelf clouds. And again, shelf clouds, they're associated with the leading edge of outflow. It's uh, the forward flank of supercells or along the leading edge of squall lines is where you'll see these things. Think strong winds followed by heavy rainfall, potentially very heavy rainfall, potentially very strong winds. Shelf clouds point away from the rain area. And again, they're caused by outflow. It's not a tornado feature, although you will see turbulence in the bottom of these things many times and maybe uh, some cloud features getting pulled up into there. They will produce uh, dirt getting kicked up, gust nados. We'll talk about what those are later, uh, but generally more think straight line winds. And this image and the radar here, where is this, the shelf cloud going to be? Along the outflow, not necessarily where the rain is. See the outflow coming out away uh, away from the storm there. That little thin blue line is the outflow boundary. So this is a couple of examples of what a shelf cloud with a supercell may look like. And again, these will occur along where the outflow boundaries of these storms exist. June 1st, 2019, shelf cloud approaching Amarillo. I want to draw your attention Oops, draw your attention to the radar imagery uh, here on the uh, left. And you can see right about now, big wind showing up on the radar on the south side of Amarillo. Had over a 90 mile an hour wind gust uh, that was measured with a mesonet site there. And this also produced quite a bit of flooding. In this next video, we're going to show you what it looked like west of Amarillo in the rain area behind this line. So notice the power line almost falling down on these guys. Anytime you're out there, power poles do tend to get snapped with severe winds. They measured on this vehicle a 66 mile an hour wind gust, and that's just barely above the, the roof of the vehicle. So easily 60, 70 mile an hour wind gust, it's very heavy rain. And on the left of this, you see what I-40 looked like when you get 20, uh, in 20 minute period, get an inch of rain, that just overwhelms the drainage systems, causes a bunch of flooding in urban areas. I've never understood why when there's three cars stalled out in flooded roads, why a fourth and fifth car decides to try their luck. Uh, just doesn't make any sense, but we see it all the time. Do not drive into flooded waters. Wall clouds are inflow features. They point toward the rain shaft. They're a gathering point below the updraft, usually one step before a funnel. They're like fingerprints for supercells. Wall clouds are all a little bit different. But unlike your and my fingerprints, which stay constant, wall clouds are always changing. Uh, so, But they're all a little bit different. Wall clouds all have a little different appearance to them. But it's that localized lowering. They point towards the rain shaft. Look at that, all that moisture feeding into the storm at the end of that video there on the right. If they are persistent and have organized rotation beneath the mesocyclone, are they in the right place? Is it a feature where you think it should be? 
and they're exhibiting rising motion and persistent rotation, and they're lower based, like this one on the right, they're becoming more concerning. So what does violent or strong rotation look like in real time? This video is not sped up. If you have violent rotation, there is no doubting it. If you see rotation that looks like this, you need to report it. If you see any rotation, you should report it. But I want you to understand what, what rotation is going to look like very close to when a tornado occurs. And so you see this is actually trying to form a funnel on the left side of this wall cloud. And it, as we zoom in here, it's actually starting to be a tornado on the ground. And you're starting to see uh, ground circulation showing up. So that's what violent rotation is going to look like to you. So comparing the two, again, just for a summary, shelf clouds are caused by the downdraft or outflow. Wall clouds are caused by updrafts and inflow. Shelf clouds point away from the rain shaft and away from the rain area. Think straight line winds, straight line winds, not tornadoes. Wall clouds point toward the rain area. If they're rotating, think potential tornado. So given what we talked about, what do you think is the more concerning of these two wall clouds? Picture A or picture B? Give you a second to look at that. And then I will give you the answer here quickly for the sake of time. The more concerning is picture B for two reasons. One, much more low hanging base of a thunderstorm. Number two, much more circular appearance of the wall cloud as opposed to A that's a little more spread out uh, and kind of just sprawling. It's, it could be rotating, but the stronger rotation, those wall clouds tend to shrink down and become more round. And so for those two reasons, B is the more concerning wall cloud. So we're going to give you a look at this classic supercell from April 22nd, 2015. It is actually the day that I arrived in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, we had a classic supercell first day on the job. Uh, so it's always will have a sweet spot in my heart. But in this, you see a beaver tail extending towards the camera. It ends with a wall cloud uh, below that. You can certainly see the rain cool air getting picked back up into the updraft. Easily can see the rotation. This is sped up, but easily see the rotation of your mesocyclone uh, above the wall cloud feature. Just a classic, classic supercell structure. So we're going to talk a little bit about tornadoes here. What do tornadoes and figure skaters have in common? Conservation of angular momentum. What is happening to this figure skater when she pulls her arms and legs in closer to her body? She speeds up. And it's because in order to conserve energy, that's how energy is conserved when you change your center of gravity from out further out from your body to close in. That is the reason tornadoes get the intense wind speeds they do. You've got a broader circulation. It gets ingested into this thunderstorm. The updraft and downdraft stretch it, and it shrinks and stretches, and, and then it has to speed up to conserve energy, just like the figure skater. So that's what those two things have in common. Supercell tornadoes go through a life cycle. Generally, they start with a wall cloud that forms under the updraft. Notice on the radar, there's broad rotation, but nothing spectacular. Funnel cloud will form then an, in, within your wall cloud area somewhere, uh, and you see the rotation getting better on radar. No visible signs that it's touching the ground at this point. We go from that to a tornado on the ground, and I want you to notice if you want an idea that the stretching is going on, look how large the wall cloud is here and look how much it gets stretched up into the updraft of this storm. And you can see the, there are rear flank downdraft creating a, what we were going to call an RFD cut with that clearing on the left side. We're going to talk about that in part two. So the condensation funnel reaches the ground in serious stretching and notice the gate, the very strong inbound and outbound winds on the radar are now showing up. But if you waited for that, you're going to be a little slow getting this tornado warning out. So here's a mature tornado, large tornado on the ground. 
rain curtain is wrapping in this case completely around it. Very clear radar signature uh, showing up there. There's a few different ways that tornadoes end their life cycle. The most classic way is for them to rope out, but they, and then they'll dissipate. Basically the rear flank downdraft cuts off the inflow and these things just kind of dwindle down. But they do end sometimes just by lifting up off the ground and then just kind of dissipating. Or I've seen them just literally just one second they're there and the next second they're not. Uh, but the more classic version is the roping out of a tornado. This radar example here, uh, you see the hook showing up. Classic hook signature on the left in the reflectivity. On the right, we have what you can find on, on many radar apps now called correlation coefficient. So I'm going to tell you that ball on the end of this hook is not rain wrapping. It is debris. How do I know that? Raindrops are relatively uniform. Hailstones are a little less uniform, but they're still relatively uniform. Raindrops and hail show up at the higher end of the scale. Something close to one is certainly above 0.8. Correlation coefficient is measuring the uniformity of objects. Debris is not uniform. You got tree limbs of different sizes, two by fours, leaves, whatever, not very uniform. It's going to show up very low on the scale. So that's a, that is a massive ball of debris associated with a large tornado on the ground. Here is the velocity. This is a textbook tornado velocity signature. Green again toward the radar, which is on the left. The red is away from the radar. But notice this feature right here. What do you think that we're seeing there? That is the rear flank downdraft wrapping around the storm. And we'll show later these RFD cut, and, and you'll see how this relates a little bit better. But very commonly on the northern edge of your rear flank downdraft, you get that tornado spin up. Very, very classic. Tornadoes cycle. And many times you get a tornado and many supercells, unless something changes in the environment or they start to weaken, once they produce one tornado, it's very common that they produce another. Usually there's a gap between the original tornado and the next tornado that forms, maybe 15, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, maybe a half hour uh, for things to cycle. But in extreme wind shear environments, sometimes there is no delay. And in this case, the same supercell had two tornadoes at the same time. The original tornado on the left and the developing new tornado on the right and the spotter to the east, this is what they saw. It's what they call a wedge handoff. Two wedge tornadoes on the ground. The first one hadn't even dissipated yet before the new one was forming. When you have multiple vortices spinning around these tornadoes, around a parent tornado circulation that's called a multi-vortex tornado. And this is an example of that very classic example from Gerald, Texas. This is an EF, well, at the time they were F5. They were used to be the Vegeta scale. The EF stands for Enhanced Vegeta when we made some changes to that. But you see the three different vortexes that are apparent around the larger tornado circulation. That's a multi-vortex tornado. Okay, so... I put the end question mark because that is the end of the first part of this two-part series uh, for the 2021 Skywarn Spotter Training Course from National Weather Service in Amarillo. Uh, please, at your earliest convenience, to complete the course, view part two of the series, uh, which you can find there on YouTube as well. And there will be a little quiz on that, and it will provide instructions to you on how to register as a spotter uh, once you have completed the course. So. Uh, we appreciate your attention, and again, uh, please uh, visit part two of the series at your earliest convenience. Thank you.